Tonight on BCN Weekly News, in this week's special report, the celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month and what resources are out there on campus. Also during the month, convocation reform, what students need to know as a new convocations director steps into the role, as well as the impact of Heli Hurricane Helene and how students are coping with this natural disaster. And lastly, the Bell Hooks Institute officially reopened and why this will benefit students. All of this is, and more coming up soon, tonight on BCN Weekly News. Live from BCN Arts Studio in Berea, Kentucky, this is BCN Weekly News. Good evening and welcome back to another news broadcast by BCN Weekly News. My name is Gage Parker. Hispanic Heritage Month began on September 15th. I asked students about their experiences with resources on campus. Here's what they had to say. At the heart of Latinx student life on campus is the Espacio Cultural Latinx, or the ECL, a safe and welcoming space for study, conversation, and cultural exchange. The ECL aims to foster growth and awareness of Latinx issues through community building programs and activities, offering a place where students can thrive academically and personally. A student organization to highlight is the Latin American Student Organization, or LASO, which brings vibrant cultural events to campus, such as karaoke nights, pottery workshops, and festivals. LASO works to promote appreciation for Latinx heritage, helping students and faculty experience and celebrate the richness of Latinx traditions. The Hispanic Outreach Program is another vital resource. It's a service learning effort that brings together Celts, several community organizations, and the Department of Foreign Languages at Bria College. HOP aims to build bridges among the Spanish-speaking and the English-speaking residents of Madison County. Hispanic Heritage Month is really important for us here at HOP because, like I said, we get to do a lot of things with the community, and uh, we're actually planning on doing a collaboration with the LJAC Center where we're going to go and set up some candy, uh, some papers for people to read, and just some information about what the month is, and just for awareness for more people on campus and visitors that come through campus on a daily basis. For those interested in music, the Mariachi Performance Ensemble celebrates the traditional music of Mexico. Students in this ensemble use a variety of instruments and perform classic songs, bringing the songs of Mexico to Bria's campus. Hi, I'm a student president for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship on campus. One of my responsibilities is to host a Bible study in Spanish for Latino students on campus called Conectate. Um, some other resources that I've enjoyed are the Cafecito y Pan, which is a support group for Latina students on campus, as well as the Latino Male Initiative, which I have no experience with, but I have heard great things about, and as well as Sazon Latino, a dance group on campus. I absolutely enjoy um, their performances on Mountain Day, and it brings me a piece of home. Back to you in the studio. In other news, convocations are changing as the new director of convocations settles into the position. Adjustments are being brought about. Amaya with more on this. The Office of Convocations and SGA have been working on convocation reform policies in order to accommodate to student needs. These accommodations include lowering the convocation requirements and expanding the kinds of events that can count toward convocation credit for students. Currently, the length of convocations has been shortened to 45 minutes, ending at 3.45 p.m. rather than 4.15 p.m., and the Q&A sessions at the end of the speaker convocations have been discontinued. I spoke with SGA student body president and member of the convocations committee, Abraham Garcia Romero, to talk more about the current and future changes of convocation and what students can do to help promote the implementation of these changes. This past summer, Dr. Emmanuel Stokes got hired on as the new director of convocations and uh, the SGA got a new administration. And so every time there's something new, it's time to enact change, right? There's always that opportunity to get something done. And so EJ had some ideas, the SGA had some other ideas. We met at the very, very beginning of the year and we just had a huge brainstorming session. Some of the new conversations around what convo could look like in the future includes a room suited for individuals who suffer from sensory overload. This room would be live streaming the convocation and people who would need that would go there and still receive their convo credit. 
Um, this idea was not EJ's or SJ's alone. There has been input, um, especially from our non-traditional student com uh, community, um, which we value tremendously, and I want to thank them for the, that input and this push for so many years. Um, another thing that SGA has been working on to push is the expansion of what events count for convocation. Currently, it's convo, it's the convo programming, but also I know performances by dance and theater performances. But we said, how can we make this more available and accessible to campus? And so we're suggesting that programming by the Black Cultural Center or the Bell Hook Center be included as a part of convo credit. Both the direct, the new director of convo, and the SGA agree that it's time that we reduce the amount of required convocations for students. We don't have an exact number, but preliminary talks are reducing the amount from seven to five. Five convocations. And I also advocated in case students are not able to reach that required five, there be no GPA penalty. In the meantime, my advice is that people be present at convocation, that they follow all of the rules that have been established because, because that signals to our administrators that we're ready for change. The Office of Convocation staff heavily encourage students to maintain respectful behavior while attending convocation speeches or performances in order to exemplify maturity and positive representation of our student body, as these changes may not be able to come into fruition without cooperation. Examples of respectful behavior and proper convocation etiquette include attentiveness to the speaker or performer, silencing cell phones until the convocation concludes, and keeping talking to a minimum throughout the duration of the service. Conversations of future changes are still in the works with the convocation committee, but we will be sure to keep you all updated on changes that will definitively be put into effect. This is all we have on current and possible future convocation reform policies. Reporting from the CMIT building for BCN Weekly Report, this was Amaya Weekly. Back to you, Gage. Thanks, Amaya. We'll keep you updated as more changes develop. This past month has seen many natural disasters. Hurricane Helene tore through communities, some of which students from Berea are from. Quinn collected student experiences in this difficult time. Hurricane Helene impacted six southern U.S. states on September 26, 2024. Even though the hurricane didn't impact Berea specifically, it did impact Berea students as many of them lived in the states that the hurricane affected. Helene first hit Florida's Big Bend region and near midnight on September 26th, it hit near the city of Perry as a Category 4 hurricane. It then spread to areas such as Tampa, Pinellas County, Sunset Beach, Cedar Key, and Steinhatchee. The hurricane was so powerful in these areas that it caused electrical hazards, fires, and swept homes away. Helene then moved to Georgia early Friday morning, where it was categorized as a Category 2 hurricane. In places like Atlanta, 12 to 15 inches of rain fell upon the state, paired with devastating winds. Helene weakened into a tropical storm as it moved towards the Carolinas, but still had drastic effects. In South Carolina, strong winds and jaw-dropping amounts of rain were present. In West North Carolina, specifically the city of Asheville, many residents were forced to seek safety on rooftops. Bridges and roads crumbled and houses floated away. In Tennessee, heavy rainfall destroyed Interstate 40, a highway connecting North Carolina and Tennessee. Homes in Roan Mountain were flooded and people left their cars stranded on September 27th. In Afton, the Kainzer Bridge on Highway 107 was completely destroyed and parts of Virginia also suffered from Helene. We at Berea College News sought out students affected by the hurricane to gather their thoughts. So I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. The storms were passing through and just like, I could see like the damage in different communities, like houses were demolished. The sewage is not really good in Tennessee at all. So like you could see like water still in the streets. Um, I remember I watched this TikTok of this lady like showing the water rushing through her house. And that's just like, it kind of hit me to the point where like, I can't really do much, but I knew like, okay, if I donate something that can help the community, like, you know, get their things at least like buying, you know, water, food, supplies, like stuff like that. I'm from Rosman, North Carolina and Hurricane Helene um, destroyed my town. Um, 
and surrounding towns. Um, my parents had no power for a week and no water. They were on a boil advisory. So um, they were only eating because of my stepdad's mom's store. So um, that was really hard on them. And Asheville got hit really hard. Um, they have no supplies either. And I'm right outside of Asheville. Um, there's still people with no power and um, no water and they can't shower or anything. I'm from Elizabethan, Tennessee. I am right in the areas that has been destroyed by the flooding. Um, it's just been a travesty because all of my town has pretty much been washed away and that's, it's a hard way to say it, but it's, that's pretty much accurate. Um, my house has been unaffected, my family's okay, but the roads to my houses are completely destroyed and there's so many, many people missing and um, it's just hard to see it while you're four hours away at college and there's nothing you can really do about it. Um, and there's more hurricanes that are happening as we speak and you just don't know what that's going to happen. If they're going to wind up at my house again or if they're going to go the opposite direction. Um, my aunts and uncles houses have been obliterated and they're just gone. And I can only call my family at certain times when they have service or if they have Wi-Fi and it's very rare. And it's, it's just devastating because we're a landlocked community and we don't have hurricane routes and we're not prepared for anything like this. And I think it's going to affect my community for years. We at Berea College News wanted to end this segment by informing Berea students that counseling services are available in Fairchild Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Services are also available 24-7 if you contact Public Safety at 859-985-3333 if you prefer to speak with an on-call therapist. Thanks, Quinn. BCN hopes that all students use the resources on campus to cope with this tragedy. For our last story, the Bell Hooks Institute has reopened this year on Hooks' birthday. Here's Izzy with more. On the 25th of September, Bree College celebrated its annual Bell Hooks Day. This year, the college and the Bell Hooks Estate honor the author by reopening the Bell Hooks Institute. Known for her renowned writings in race and gender studies, Hooks became a professor in residence at Berea College in 2004 and established the Bell Hooks Institute in 2015. Shortly after her passing in 2021, the Institute closed its doors. Now, Berea College, along with Linda Strongleek, the executor of the Bell Hooks Estate and close friend to Bell, are relaunching the Institute and all that it encompasses. For many students, especially those in women and gender studies, the Institute is a hub for activism, centering topics that Hooks wrote about such as feminism, race, and sexuality. I spoke to some students about what this reopening means to them. I think it'll be beneficial to WGS students specifically to have that space for talks because, you know, the Bell Hook Center is great, but it's a little more resource oriented. It's a little more um, student oriented. I feel like this will be a lot more focused towards um, educating and expanding. I think that it'll be nice to have a space to liberate all um, of the students through Belle's work and all that she's done for the college. Yeah, there's so many amazing programs that happen at the Bell Hook Center, but the Institute is such a great place to both hold Belle's old belongings and just mementos that weren't in the archive, as well as having different conversations within the field of like feminism and everything as a place to help nurture other activists. So it's not really student focused necessarily. Like it's really for everybody. Kind of like Belle saying that feminism is for everybody. Yeah, I think it's really incredible. I know the amount of work and time they put into just like restoring the building and everything. And I think it's a great thing to put together, especially with Belle's transition, um, to remember all the wonderful work that she did. The Bell Hook Center is amazing and this is just another great step forward. The Bell Hooks Institute is now officially open to all students, faculty, and staff. It is located on Center Street across from the Log House Craft Gallery. The building is filled with Bell's writings, art collection, and original paintings. The campus community is encouraged to visit and experience the lasting legacy of Bell Hooks. Reporting from the Bell Hooks Institute, I'm Izzy Spence for BCN Weekly Report. Thanks, Izzy. On behalf of our news team, thank you for watching BCN Weekly News. I'm Gage Parker. For more coverage, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bria College News and Radio. And watch our show online at www.bcnnewsradio.com. Good night. <laughs>
live from BCN Arts Studio in Berea, Kentucky. This is BCN Weekly News.